in mm -hmm. case you in case you uh, downloaded the, the older version. But there's there's not much change again. I just added a few things. Okay, so the urinary system consists mm -hmm. is composed of two kidneys, two ureters, two bladders, two pelvises. You guys <laughs> one bladder, one urethra. The <laughs> adrenal glands or the suprarenals are part of the endocrine system. Okay, so they're not part of the urinary system. It's completely different. <coughs> Knowing where the kidneys are located is half the battle in performing these urinary procedures. Um, the kidney is bean shaped. It's on either side of the vertebral column, one left, one right. Which one is going to be lower, the right or the left? Right. It's going to be the right. Okay, so the right kidney is going to be lower because of the <coughs> liver. Because of the liver, which also means that the ureter is also going to be shorter. So kidneys located on either side of the uh, L spine. It is most posterior part of the abdominal cavity and. The middle of the kidneys are located between L1 and L2. Between L1 and L2. Okay. The kidneys and the ureters are part of the retroperitoneal structure, so they're in the very back of the peritoneum. Below the peritoneum, you will find your distal ureters, urinary bladder, and then the urethra. Make note that when we are looking at the ureter, the ureters leave the kidney anteriorly, make its way down and enters the bladder posteriorly. There's some fast fingers back there. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to hire you as my secretary. <laughs> All right, kidney orientation. Because, because of the psoas muscle, it causes the kidneys to have a 20-degree vertical angulation. So in other words, the kidneys are not like this. They actually have a rotation like this because of the psoas muscle. So there's a 20-degree angulation. The kidney is broken up into two different poles. You have an upper pole and you have a lower pole. An upper and a lower. The upper pole of the kidneys are gonna be close because of that uh, angulation. The upper pole is gonna be closer to the midline. And the medial border is going to be more anterior. So now, here are the kidneys, they're like this, okay? Now I'm gonna put them down like this, and the medial border turns this way. Medial is more anterior, okay? I think you can get a better depiction of that here on this image here, okay? So the medial border is more anterior. And we are talking about a 30 degree obliquity of those kidneys. 30 degree obliquity. So again, the psoas muscles are involved in causing the, the kidneys to rotate in such a way. So if I wanted to put the, let's just say here, this is the right side, this is the left side. So let's just say I wanted to look at the kidney in true profile, okay? Which is best, do I do an RPO or an LPO to look at the left kidney? I, I have LPO. to do, LPO. well here's the right side, I'm gonna have to rotate them towards uh, the RPO right side. Yeah. RPO. Okay, and if you wanna look at the right, you do an LPO. miss anything on the previous slide. Right lower than left, left kidney longer and narrower, narrower than the right. Okay. All right, any questions about these two slides? Okay. 
So the kidneys are, are halfway between, uh, between the xiphoid process and the iliac crest. We said the midline is L1, L2. So the middle of the kidney is at the level between L1 and L2. They start off at the level of T11, T12, and extends all the way down to approximately L3. Now, there is a possibility that the kidneys can drop from its normal position. But first, let's look at this. So location changes because they are loosely attached. So the kidneys are loosely attached. So when you breathe in, the kidney is going to drop about one inch or one lumbar spine. And if you're in an upright position, it's going to drop two inches. Now, if it drops more than one inch, if you're laying down, I'm sorry, in the inhalation, and if you uh, are standing up, it's going to drop another, if it drops more than that, it's known as nep nephroptosis. And the problem with nephroptosis is because it drops from its normal position, what do you think is going to happen to those ureters? They're going to bunch up. They're going to kink. And so nephroptosis can contribute to a blockage or an occlusion or a stenosis or a tightening of the, um, the ureter due to the kidneys dropping. <clears throat> okay? Questions? So the function of the urinary system is to remove waste products from the circulatory system in the form of urine and eliminate it from the body. It removes nitrogenous waste. These wastes are including urea and creatinine. And these wastes are byproducts of protein metabolism. So here's one that I did change that I caught. It should say decreased creatinine. Yeah. It should say increased creatinine. On your old slide, it said decreased. Okay, so I changed that one. So one of the things that you're gonna be checking for when you do one of these procedures is you do your clinical history, but you're also gonna be checking for their lab, lab, uh, lab reports. And the two lab reports that we check on is their BUN, which stands for blood, urea, nitrogen. Blood, urea, nitrogen and then creatinine. Both these things, again, are byproducts of protein, uh, protein synthesis, or I'm sorry, protein metabolism. So with that said, BUN and creatinine are gonna be slightly higher with men. Why? Because we love to eat meat. We're meat eaters. No, seriously. Okay, yeah, so BUN and creatinine are generally higher in men. <clears throat> now, again, that's expected. However, if they become elevated, not just increased, but elevated beyond normal, that's an indication that there is something wrong with the kidneys because the kidneys are supposed to be filtering these byproducts out. And if we're finding it in the, if we're finding a lot of this stuff in the blood, the kidney is not doing what it's supposed to do to get rid of it. Okay, so elevated BUN and creatinine is an indication that there is something wrong with the kidneys. So why should we be concerned with that? Stones, I guess. Okay, well, Let's talk about contrast studies. Why should we be concerned with elevated BUN and creatinine with iodinated contrast? It can't filter it. Okay, it can't filter it, right? Well, let me take it an, an, another step further. Contrast is what? Is it thick or is it thin? Thin, iodine. Iodine, is it thick or is it thin? Thin. Oh, it's thin. thick. Oh, it's thick. Thick. It's, oh yes, <laughs> thick. Compared to blood, it's much thicker. I was comparing to barium. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got contrast mixed with the blood going to your kidneys, if there's a problem with the kidneys, the kidneys have to work a little bit harder to eliminate the contrast, mm. which can put the patient over into renal failure. Okay, we can 
harm, we can destroy the kidney by overworking it. And this is why we need to check these labs to make sure that they are within range. We have a slide that'll demonstrate, that'll show you what the normal range is. Okay, next one here is the um, urinary system also regulates your water levels and regulates your acid base balance and electrolyte levels of the blood. All right. So we said the kidney has an upper pole and it has a lower pole. And the poles are separated by this area right here. It's called the hyalur region, the hilum. The region is called the hyalur region. And this is where you have all these different vessels. You have your renal vein, renal artery, your lymphatics and nerves, and also the ureter coming out of the hyalur region, the hyalur area. Okay. Urine production. So normally we intake about 2.5 liters a day of water. And the water comes from liquids, from food, and they are also end products of metabolism. So 2.5 liters per day. One liter every 60 seconds of blood flows through the kidneys. One liter every 60 seconds of blood flows through the kidneys. And produces 180 liters of filtrates in 24 hours. Filtrates is just a byproduct of the, the filtration of the blood. Okay, that's the filtrate. So 99% of the filtrate is reabsorbed into the system whereas the remaining 1% then becomes urine. So 99% is reabsorbed and the remaining 1% goes into urine. And so urine, we produce around 1.5 liters a day. Because she knows all this. <laughs> all right, let's, let's uh, analyze the microscopic structure of the kidneys. Um, you have two basic, uh, two basic layers, if you will. The very outside of it is the cortex, and then the middle is the uh, medulla. And the cortex is where you're going to find the, uh, the functioning system, I'm sorry, the, the functioning portion of the kidneys. And this is where you're going to find the nephrons. Now, I do want you guys to be familiar with these two terms down here. When we refer to the kidney, we're referring to the actual structural component. It's a structural reference. And the renal parenchyma is the functional reference. So you will hear physicians referring to it not as the kidney, but the renal parenchyma. And again, that's referring to the functional portion of the kidney. Okay, so that's the renal parenchyma. All right, so the nephrons, again, is gonna be the functioning unit of the, the kidneys. So this is where uh, most of the uh, filtrates in urine is produced. Once the fluid is produced, it's gonna make its way into the renal pyramids. And so we have the renal pyramids. There, there's, there are these triangular shapes right here. These are the pyramids, the dark areas. Those are the pyramids. And the fluid starts to empty out in descending uh, widths or narrower widths of funnels, if you will. So from the renal pyramids, they empty out into the renal uh, papilla. And again, the renal pyramids are just a bunch of tubes, a bunch of microscopic tubes. And then they empty out into the renal papilla then the minor calyces, the minor calyces, which empties out into the major calyces and then the larger renal pelvis, and then the renal pelvis 
conversant to the ureter where urine is emptied out. I'm trying to think if there's something else I need to tell you guys about this. So, um, renal columns. I don't think I talked about the columns. Uh, the columns, the, the cortex, there's areas of the cortex where it starts to dip. Wherever you have areas of the cortex dipping, that's known as the column. And where the column then terminates, there's a little pocket of this column, and that's the renal sinuses. Okay, so that's where the cortex takes again those little dips. That's the column, and then uh, the little pockets, those are your renal sinuses. So let's talk about the nephrons, which are found in the cortex. The nephron is composed of the glomerulus and also long tubes. It is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. There are over one million nephrons per kidney, and this is where blood is filtered. So if we look, take a little bit closer at the, the nephron and the collecting duct, so blood is delivered to the nephron by way of the afferent, uh, afferent uh, system. Did I just say system? The afferent arteriole. And then blood is carried away with the afferent arteriole. And notice that there's, there's this series or networks of, of the, the tubes encapsulated by the uh, glomerular capsule, also known as the Bauman's capsule. And this is where you're going to find the proximal portion of each nephron. The proximal portion of each nephron. So filtrate is produced. 99% of it is reabsorbed by the body. The remaining 1% then becomes urine. And so the fluid or the solution makes its way from the Bauman's capsule, the glomerular capsule, with the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, makes its way down the descending loop, the ascending loop, and this entire area here, this loop is called the loop of Henle. Okay, so descending, ascending, then you have your distal convoluted, and then makes its way down the collecting tubes. Then you have, it goes into the manor calyx, and then I put this here on the side, just so again you understand the flow. Get it? Flow. Yeah. Goes from the minor calyx to the major calyx to the renal pelvis and then out the ureter. Major cal minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and then the ureter. The ure, uh, ureters, um, it says here, renal pelvis leaves the kidneys through the hilum to become the ureter. Ureters are uh, anywhere between 20 to 34 centimeters in length and one mil millimeter to one centimeter in diameter. And it lies right on top of the psoas muscles. Again, the psoas muscles is what causes it to have the 20 degree and then also a 30 degree liquidy. The so they leave the kidneys anteriorly and enter the postural lateral area of the bladder. So it enters postural lateral into the bladder. There are three points of constrictions where it gets a little bit tight. And this has to do again with the location and the um, orientation of the ureters to other anatomical structures. The first one here is the UPJ, or the utero pelvic junction, which is right here. You have a point of constriction there. And after you, as you make your, way day, uh, make your way down, there's going to be the pelvic rim that's also going to cause a slight stricture. 
and then the area where the ureter joins up with the bladder, again, a slight stricture demonstrated. It looks like a filling defect when it isn't, and that's your UVJ or the ureteral vesicle junction. So there is, because you have a slight snoring, uh, narrowing in those three areas, there's a possibility that um, you may have some stones in those areas as well that will get caught in those three areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no extra credit needed. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm bleeding. Oh. Thank you. No problem. It's, it's from the dry weather, so my, my skin is just mm-hmm. cracking. Okay, mm-hmm. any questions? Okay, uh, so this is the inside of the bladder. The Again, the ureters enter through the posterior side. The inside of the bladder also has uh, a folds of the mucosa called, we've, we've seen that before, right? Rouge? Is it rouge? Rouge? Rouge. So they're also folded, and the, and the function of the membrane, the inside lining, having this fold is that it allows it to expand and contract. So expansion is upward and forward as it fills up with, with urine. So it expands upward and forward. The area of the bladder on the posterior inferior part of it is known, there's a smooth muscle, it's called a trigon. It's smooth, it doesn't have rouge, a rouge. And the trigon is formed by the two openings of the uh, uterus, I want to say uterus, the ureter. That's the UV junction, and also formed by the urethra. Okay, so it's a smooth surface, unlike the rest of the bladder that has rouge. I keep changing how to say it. Uh, here we have. Uh, an IVU, which stands for intravenous urogram, demonstrating the kidneys, ureters, and the bladder. How is it that we're able to see that? I thought we can't see kidneys in the collecting system on the regular x ray. So Contrast, how do you see that? iodine. But iodine. How did they get iodine? IV. IV. So we're the ones who, uh, uh, who administer the contrast agent, goes into the blood, and then collects in the urinary system. So I put down here, this is new, okay, intravenous, IVU stands for intravenous urogram. It is also known as an IVP, which stands for intravenous pilogram. So if you hear IVP, it's an IVU. Okay, so this is general, this is old school, IVP is old school, but you still have a lot of, uh, radiologists and also technologists using that term instead of IVU. Now the proper term is is IVU because you're looking at the whole collecting system, not just the pilo. What's the pilo? What does pilo refer to? The pelvis. We're not just looking at that. We're looking at the entire system. That's why they say IVP is incorrect. But it's still it's still appropriate. Okay. So here we have the um, radiograph again, and it's referring to the kidney. Again, the kidney, we don't say kidney because that's the structural part of it, but the functional part is the renal parenchyma. So we refer to that as the renal parenchyma radiographically. Okay. Okay, some terms I want you guys to be familiar with. So don't cheat. What's micturation or urination? Huh? What? Okay, let's do this. Okay. 
act avoiding? What's incontinence? Involuntary. I'm almost there. <laughs> We're getting to that age. God forbid. <laughs> Involuntary urination. All right, retention. Not being able to. Okay, inability to avoid. Okay, we talked about extravasation uh, last week, right? What's extravasation? It's just extravagant for okay. So, yeah, so when the fluid lick, licks around the area of uh, injection, okay? So it's a leakage of fluid. But more specifically, if it's contrast, contrast causes can cause damage to the surrounding tissue. What is it now called? I gave you guys another term. Contrast extravasation. In Infiltration. Fill infiltration. Okay? So infiltration. If the solution can be harmful, it's known as infiltration. So that's the case with contrast material. Okay? So you have the urge to urinate at approximately 250 milliliters, and the total capacity of the bladder is anywhere between 300 to 500 milliliters. Okay, but you have the urge to go at about 250. Um, female pelvic or men. Let's see. What do I know about it? You know how to wipe. <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> but you come there without your mom, though. That wasn't Dr. F who said that. <laughs> All right. So the difference between male and female is with the female, the reproductive portion and the urinary portion are two separate entities. As you can see, they have two, two different outputs or, or canals. So you have a urethra for the urinary system and then you also have the, the vagina over here, which again, they're two separate portions. Whereas in a male, look over here, the male, the urethra is shared by both the urinary system as well as the reproductive system. So they share the, the one tube. Also the difference here is, well it's not much of a difference, but this is why women have, always have the urge to go to the bathroom when they're pregnant because it presses down right into the bladder. That's all I gotta say. Uh, James, you wanna add anything? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he does. <laughs> and here's here's the male issue. You have the prostate gland. What's the purpose of the prostate gland? To cause problems. To cause problems. <laughs> so it's what it's what provides the, the lubrication uh, of the se of the semen of the, the sperm. So the sperm and the prostate um, solution, I don't know what you want to call it, but that's what forms semen. And so when this becomes enlarged, it can cause the, the male to have difficulty urinating, causing, what is it, retention? Mm -hmm. Another thing I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Now imagine how I am when I have a little bit to drink. Oh! I'm drinking a lot of information. Need to know. We need to go. To that's the that's why at the party I didn't drink. No, you didn't. no. Well, I did a little bit. You did? I did. I missed. Yeah. Geo spiked my drink. Good job. <laughs> yeah, he said it was just horchata. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I bring that to the potluck? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, here we have the retrograde pilogram. Retrograde meaning what? Backwards. We're going to do a backflow. 
So this <coughs> here, so here we are filling up the kidneys with a catheter that goes into the urethra, into the bladder. So what you're so what you're seeing here is not the uh, ureter itself. This is a catheter that's been inserted through the bladder, through the ureter of the renal pelvis. Okay. And it's a retrograde fill, meaning that at the end of this catheter, we're going to inject contrast through it, filling up the entire urinary system. So here, uh, so on the right, you have a catheter, retrograde filling. And on the left, there's no catheter there. This is just normal filling. <clears throat> so can we see the different calyces? You have your, you have your minors, you have your major, right? It fills up into the renal pelvis, and then it goes into the ureter, and then you're good to go. How big is the catheter that you're on? The catheter is. They're, they are in French sizes, so it means it's really small. Um, they're they're measured in millimeters. Yeah, really, really tiny. I don't know how big your ureter is, so that's why. I'm, oh yeah. It's, like, oh, it's pretty small, yeah. I think so. Well, let's, let's go back over here. The ureter in in diameter is about one millimeter to one centimeter. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, do you think you need to be knocked out to have this done? Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you because you, yeah, have you heard of people uh, <clears throat> passing stones? Oh. They say, well, for men, they say it's like having a baby. For women, I guess if you have a stone, it's not a big deal, right? <laughs> so now imagine you're not, it's not a stone, but it's a catheter going all the way up your ureter and into your kidney. Do you think you need, you need to be knocked out? Heavily sedated. Okay. But we do these in interventional radiology. This is, uh, we do this in interventional radiology. It's also common in, uh, in OR with the urologists when they're trying to evaluate the function. So when you put a catheter like this, this is a non-functional study. Okay, it's non-functional. All we're trying to do is we're looking at the, the outline of the structure. Now, if we injected contrast and then the contrast injected, I'm um, sorry, was collected here on the kidney, now it's a functional study because we get to see it fill and we get to see it empty naturally. This is functional, this is not. So retrograde is not functional. Retrograde is not function. It's not a functional study. It's just simply to look at the the, the, stru uh, the structure of, of the system. My keyboard died. Oh, oh clicker died too. It's a sign. Uh oh. <laughs> Avoiding uh, voiding cysto, uh, cystourethrogram. So what we do here is that we catheterize, and we put a urinary catheter into our patient, and we simply fill up the bladder with just gravity. There's no injection required. The, the contrast is filled through a, a catheter pulling up the bladder. And so once the bladder is filled up, we take pictures with the patient in different positions. We'll do AP, we'll do obliques. And then what we'll do is then we will remove the catheter. We'll remove the catheter and have the patient void. So we're seeing the entire bladder as well as the urethra. Okay. Male or female? Okay, we say it's a child. How do we know it's a child? The plates. Okay, we're going to see that. The plates, you guys see them there? You see the growth plate right there? On the pelvis? Okay. Growth plate over there. Male or female? Oh, wait. So anatomically, whose urethra is longer? Is it going to be boy or girl? It's going to be the boy, right? So this is the urethra. It's a boy.
All right, urography and contrast media, radiographic examination of the urinary system. We are going to be using water soluble. What does it mean by water soluble? We absorb it and we eliminate it. So we can absorb it into our vascular system and it's eliminated okay, when you urinate. Okay, that's water soluble. What about barium? Is barium water soluble? No, it's not, right? And if you don't, if you if you leave it in the system for a long period of time and it persists, it hardens up because it is a metal suspension. We can't absorb it, but this one we can. Iodine is iodinated contrast media. Iodine has a atomic number of 53. It has the ability to absorb x-rays, and this is why we can see it under uh, we can see it radiographically. We, you guys already know the difference between ionic and non-ionic, right? Do we have a test on this again, or are we done now? When did you guys have your tests on contrast? Last class. Did we have a test? Um, right? Yes. Okay. Do you guys know the difference between ionic and non-ionic? Uh, spelling. Huh? <laughs> the, viscosity. Yes. the viscosity, right? So ionic has more contrast. A more iodine, this is going to be more lethal than non-ionic. You guys remember that now? Mm -hmm. Ionic has less contrast, less lethal. Okay. I keep saying contrast, less iodine. So radiographically, which looks more pleasing to the eye? Ionic. ionic. Non-ionic. Ionic. Ionic. But the problem with that is that it can cause an allergic reaction. Okay, more lethal. And then this is less iodine more pleasant to the patient, but visually it's not as good. All right, so injected intravenously or through a catheter. I think this is, I think this is Bontrager. Mm -hmm. You know Bontrager? No, I, no? I actually oh. don't, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just to know you. You sound like you knew him. <laughs> oh, the other day. But this guy, yeah, I see him all the time. Oh, do you? On campus. <laughs> oh, in the book, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is his book. This is book, yeah. That's the reason I don't see books. <laughs> okay, so going back, ionic contrast is uh, more risk of uh, a reaction. Uh, if pre-warm, it reduces viscosity. Remember, we talked about keeping contrast in a dark, warm area. So the purpose of it being placed in a warmer is that it does reduce viscosity. So when you're injecting it, it's a lot thinner and it's more, it doesn't hurt as much as when you are injecting something a little bit more thick, more viscous. So we keep it closed, we keep it warm because light breaks down the molecular composition. Um, and then here is again a refresher on the osmolalities. Blood has about 300 milliosmoles. Ionic, very, very thick compared to blood, and then non-ionic is very close to um, blood. All right. Have you guys had a chance to look at the, the contrast in your departments? Mm -hmm. So the only, I mean, when you look at them, if you're just looking at the contents, the, all the